from the basics, clear your concepts and take you forward in the journey of dermoscopy. And today we have uh, three amazing lectures from one international faculty, Dr. Enzo Ericetti, who's world renowned for his uh, dermoscopic contributions, as well as our very own Dr. Balkrishna Nikam sir and Dr. Keshav Murthy Adhyay sir. We also have uh, Dr. Raghunath S. sir following the panel discussion uh, thereafter. We will be inviting all the questions from the delegates in the chat box. You are welcome to ask the questions at any point of time. One of us from the faculty member or from the team of Academy of Dermoscopy will go ahead and answer all your queries. We have a power packed session of uh, fantastic lectures, so I will not take more of your time. So I introduce our first speaker, Dr. Keshav Murthy Adhya sir, who is going to be dealing with basic science of dermoscopy. He is the Associate Professor of Sri B.M. Patil Medical College and Hospital and Research Center. He is also the Joint Secretary of the Academy of Dermoscopy. He has 33 publications in national and international journals and he has multiple book chapters. Sir is not present in person due to certain other uh, emergency commitments that has come across, but we have his video pe presentation for the uh, topic on basic science of dermoscopy. I request uh, Mr. Rahul to play the video uh, presentation. Mr. Rahul, we are unable to hear the presentation. Could you kindly look into it? There is no volume yet. Could you restart the presentation? If there, there, there seems to be a technical glitch. Certain things in the skin no, it's audible right now. Amenable to the naked eye or even with Hello? the magnifying lens. So basically, dermoscopy adds. Yes, it's audible. Yes. Assessment yes. Protocol. Could you restart the presentation yes. right from the beginning? Yes, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. First of all, I'd like to welcome everyone who has joined us today on behalf of Academy of Dermoscopy. I'll share my screen now. Okay, so my talk today is on the basic aspects of thermoscopy and this is mainly intended for the beginners because I'm going to discuss certain very basic and very elementary aspects of thermoscopy and hence I request uh, all the experts and people who are already into thermoscopy to kindly bear with me. <clears throat> so I'll start with a very basic question of what is thermoscopy. Then I'll discuss about what are the applications of dermoscopy, what are the components of a conventional dermoscope, what are the principles involved in dermoscopy, and what are different techniques of dermoscopy. 
once we are aware of these, then I'll try to uh, touch upon what to look for in a lesion through the dermoscope, how to describe the findings uh, of dermoscopy, and uh, end up with uh, uh, discussing certain advantages and limitations of dermoscopy. So, dermoscopy is basically a diagnostic non invasive imaging technique that provides us with a basic uh, advantage of being able to see certain things in the skin lesion that are not amenable to the naked eye or even with the magnifying lens. So basically, dermoscopy adds an edge to the clinical uh, assessment protocol. So what does it actually add? So either it helps you to uh, confirm your clinical diagnosis or it can assert your clinical diagnosis or sometimes it can actually refute your clinical diagnosis and suggest an alternative diagnosis, which can be either confirmatory or you can later confirm with biopsy. If nothing at all, at least uh, dermoscopy, what it does is that it narrows down the clinical differentials. If you have like four or five clinical differentials, following dermoscopy, uh, they are definitely narrowed down to maybe two or three. So this is how dermoscopy helps you in routine clinical assessment of skin lesions. So what are the applications of dermoscopy? So basically it is a diagnostic tool, but it can also be used as a tool for monitoring the lesional evolution or even treatment response. And it, uh, this is an, a very important uh, application of dermoscopy to decide on biopsy or excision. And this is of relevance, especially in malignancies. Uh, dermoscopy can detect abnormal changes at a very early stage and prompt you to carry out a biopsy or excision. Or conversely, it may also uh, let you continue monitoring the lesion and prevent unnecessary biopsy or excision of the lesions as well. And uh, this is also another important application, especially when we are dealing with larger lesions. Dermoscopy can help you locate precisely a particular area of the lesion, which can give you high diagnostic yield on biopsy. So dermoscopy directed biopsy uh, is routinely practiced nowadays so as to increase the fruitfulness of uh, biopsy, which is invasive procedure and we cannot do it repeatedly. Then as it is a digital imaging technique, the digital images can be shared at, uh, uh, with, at different portals with experts uh, located at remote places for consultation, learning and knowledge sharing as well. So the tool has been named as dermoscope or dermatoscope. The techniques are known as uh, dermoscopy or dermatoscopy commonly and certain other terminologies like epiluminescence microscopy, skin surface microscopy and epis episcopy are also employed. And depending on the application, dermoscopy has been given various names, for example, trichoscopy for the assessment of uh, hair and scalp uh, conditions, onychoscopy for nail disorders, capillaroscopy for nail fold capillaroscopy, inflammoscopy for inflammatory dermatosis and uh, for uh, infections and infestation, the term entomodermoscopy is employed. So these are basically dermoscopy uh, used in different uh, fields of dermatology. Now coming to the components of a, a conventional dermoscope, there are the two essential components of dermo any dermoscope are an illumination system and magnifying system, which provide the two which serve the two basic purpose of dermoscopy that is uh, uh, visualization of skin surface and subsurface structures not only in a magnified manner but in a well illuminated manner so the illumination is usually provided by the led lamps most of the dermoscopes currently dermoscope has uh, have leds and uh, older ones used to have halogen lamps and magnify magnification is provided by specialized achromatic lenses and other than that, there is power supply for handheld dermoscopy. Uh, for handheld dermoscopes, it, uh, power supply is through the rechargeable lithium ion batteries. And for video dermoscopes or fixed setups, uh, uh, power is supplied by a cable uh, connected to a power source. And image capture facility some of the dermoscopes come with inbuilt uh, image capture facility or most of the handheld uh, dermoscope allow us to attach a digital camera or a cell phone to capture the images. And uh, certain uh, advanced or uh, high-end dermoscopes can be, come with certain advancements like image storage, retrieval, and even analytical softwares. So coming to the principles of dermoscopy, there are three basic principles involved in dermoscopy. Is the illumination of the lesion, 
then uh, making sure that more and more light is and uh, entering into the lesion and the magnification of the light uh, from the lesion so the illumination will be provided by a light source uh, embedded in the thermoscope and in order to enhance the penetration of light into the skin lesion a fluid interface is made use of and magnification is provided by uh, specialized achromatic lenses let's discuss one by one so the illumination as i told most of uh, the thermoscopes have led lamps for illumination and irrespective of the hierarchy of thermoscope uh, each one of the, each one of them have two basic illumination modes one is the non polarized other is the polarized or cross polarized modes which have definitive role uh, independently in the thermoscopy and some of the thermoscopes come with certain advancements like pigment boost leds and uh, other things to enhance the pigmentary structures but basically every thermoscope has got a polarized and non polarized illumination modes now to enhance the penetration of light what is the need for enhancing the penetration of light so in thermoscopy we have got three refractive indices one uh, is the contact plate of the thermoscope which is made up of glass then there is uh, the lesional surface that is stratum corneum and the intervening air so as you can see the refractive indices of glass and stratum corneum are almost similar but the intervening air has low refractive index and because of this region most of the light that is incident onto the skin surface gets reflected back so in order to make sure that more and more light penetrates into the skin uh, an intervening medium known as the fluid interface or linkage fluid is employed whose refractive index is uh, nearer to the glass or stratum corneum so that a uniform refractive medium is created between the dermoscope and the skin lesion and hence more and more light penetrates into the skin for this purpose commonly we use uh, ultrasound gel other than that uh, even liquid paraffin or even water or mineral oil can be used but the others are uh, uh, have their own disadvantages for example mineral oil has oncogenic potential water and liquid paraffin these are less viscous and uh, they trickle down so ultrasound gel is ideal for uh, this purpose because it is highly viscous quite transparent it is bland it is non allergenic and uh, it serves the purpose very well so commonly ultrasound gel is employed for this purpose the other thing is magnification which is provided by uh, uh, achromatic lenses and most of the conventional handheld thermoscopes these days provide magnification of up to 10x commonly and some uh, new ones are coming with up to 20x uh, magnification whereas video thermoscopes and high end thermoscopes they provide up to 400x magnifications as well now uh, different types of thermoscopy so it can be polarized thermoscopy or non polarized thermoscopy depending on the illumination mode employed i'll discuss about this later then it can be either contact thermoscopy or non contact thermoscopy depending on whether the face plate of the thermoscope <coughs> is in contact with the skin lesion or it is not then we have handheld thermoscopy and video thermoscopy depending on the type of thermoscope employed coming to polarized and non polarized thermoscopy so in polarized thermoscopy the polarized illumination mode is employed and in polarized thermoscopy there are two sets of polarizers one is the source polarizer and the other is the detector polarizer as you can see in this image source polarizer polarizes the light emitted from the light source and uh, some of this polarized light undergoes simple reflection from the surface whereas the rest of it goes into the skin and undergoes what is known as scattering before it comes out so that it would have plain changed it change the plane of its polarization now the detector polarizer absorbs only the light that is coming from the deeper part of the skin or the light that has penetrated into the skin and has undergone scattering and it completely disallows the uh, uh, superficially re reflected light so in practice it means that detector polarizer allows only the light coming from the deeper part of the skin and, and the superficial glare is completely cut off and hence because of this reason uh polarized thermoscopy allows uh, clearer visualization of deeper structure as opposed to superficial structures so when we have to examine deeper structures like blood vessels uh, collagen granulomas or anything that is located deeper into the dermis polarized thermoscopy is very useful 
Uh, in contrast, in non-polarized dermoscopy, most of the light that enters the uh, light detector uh, is from the surface, from the surface, uh, which is a surface reflected light, and hence polarized, non-polarized dermoscopy helps uh, to visualize clearly the structures that are located superficially. For example, scaling, milia um, like cysts, follicular openings, and surface uh, uh, topographical changes like rugosity, scripts, depressions, etc., are better visualized by non-polarized dermoscopy. So this is just to exemplify the same. Uh, this is the same lesion which has been uh, examined under both polarized and non-polarized mode. So in the no, uh, in the polarized mode, you can see the vessels here, dotted or globular vessels, and a red and orange globule in the center, which is not clearly visible here. The vessels are almost invisible, and the central red or orange plot is also not visible. But in the non-polarized mode, the lesion, as you can see, appears more scaly as opposed to in the polarized mode. And even the surface features like depressions, uh, rugosity or crypt-like areas are better appreciated in non-polarized mode as opposed to the polarized mode. So for holistic assessment of skin lesion, one has to examine the uh, lesion under both the illumination mode so that we do not miss both the deeper as well as superficial features of uh, the skin lesion under dermoscope. Now, uh, these are, this is all about the principles of dermoscopy and different types of dermoscopy. Now we'll come to what to look for uh, in a skin lesion through the dermoscope. So basically we look for three things, structures, patterns and colors. These are the three essential uh, components of skin lesions that we uh, look uh, through the dermoscope and describe. Apart from these, we also look for the distribution of the structures and patterns follicular and perifollicular abnormalities and uh, abnormalities associated with eccrine openings and most importantly certain useful clues uh, will be seen in dermoscopy which uh, help you to arrive at a diagnosis and these clues can be specific or non-specific specific to a particular disease or non-specific can be seen in multiple diseases so the three important things are structures patterns and colors we'll discuss one by one so first the structures the structures can be defined as morphological elements on dermoscopy which have a definite shape and size and have distinct histological and or clinical correlates. So the basic, so just to give an example, so here you are able to see a yellowish white structure which is well defined, has definite shape and size. It clinically corresponds to this keratin plug and histologically corresponds to this compact hyperkeratosis. So it is a, so structure is a, an element with a definite shape and size and has got distinct histological or clinical correlate. Now coming to what are the types of structures seen under dermoscopy. So we have basic structures which are nothing, uh, which are all analogous to the primary skin lesions as we describe in dermatology. And uh, the basic structures include lines, clots, pseudopods, dots, and circles. Each of these, as you can see, are solid objects and have uh, precise definitions as well. For example, <clears throat> the lines can be defined as solid objects uh, whose length is exceedingly more than the width. Clots are solid uh, objects with definite shape and size. Pseudopods are clots with bulbous extension at the margins. Clots are, uh, can be defined as smaller clots and circles are solid structures, uh, ring-like structures whose, um, who are equidistant from a central point. So these are the basic structures. And apart from this, uh, in our field of dermoscopy, we see structureless areas, which are nothing but areas that are large enough to form patterns, but they do not have a distinct shape and size and do not have any discernible elements in them. Examples include uh, whitish fields, blotches, shiny white areas, and pigment peppering or pigment dispersion. So coming to morphology of the structure, the structure, basic structures can have different morphologies. For example, lines can be straight, curved, thick or thin, spiral, loop, coiled, wavy, also known as serpentine. So these are the different morphological uh, aspects of the lines. And clots can be defined as globules when they are uh, regular, round and oval. And when they are large and irregular, they can be uh, designated as lacunae. Dots can be fine or coarse. Circles can be complete, incomplete, or interrupted circles. So these are the different morphologies uh, the structures can have in dermoscopy. Uh, so this is an example of a line 
which has got a wavy morphology and these are the examples of circles these are the examples of globules as you can see they are more or less round or oval in shape regular in size and this is designated as a lacunae because it is large and irregular similarly one here so in the same uh, picture you can see uh, globules as well these are more or less round or oval and smaller than the lacunae and still smaller you can see the dots as well so this is how we describe the solid structures so this is an example of white structureless area as you can see it is quite large and forms a homogeneous pattern but uh, it lacks a definite shape and size so this is an example of red structureless area so this is just to uh, understand the difference so both are white areas but on but this here is well defined so you can call it white globule whereas this is large and irregular and you can call it white structureless area similarly lesional hemorrhages can be organized as red globules or they can be large and irregular as red structureless areas now coming to patterns patterns are nothing but multiple repetitions of a structure for example here you can see the globule is a primary structure and multiple repeats of uh, the globules gives a globular pattern to the lesion similarly other structures can also have different patterns for example splines can be reticular radial branching parallel and uh, pseudopods can be present circumferentially all around the uh, cloud or they can be present segmentally and similarly the dot can be form sized or non-inform sized and can be uh, organized in a definite shape like a rosette and circles can be in the form of concentric circles so this is an example of brown lines in a reticulate pattern these are the brown lines in parallel pattern so these are the white lines in a radial or uh, metaphorically known as starburst pattern so the blood vessels also can have different morphologies they can be straight curves uh, spiral looped coiled wavy and branching so this is an example of dotted vessels so this is an example of branching vessel here the branching is simple whereas here there you can see uh, the vessels are not only branching but they are progressively tapering and this type of uh, pattern has been described as arborizing pattern which is highly characteristic of basal cell carcinoma so these are the example of loop vessels and um, uh, morphologically the blood vessels are uh, designated as monomorphic when a single morphology predominates or polymorphic when multiple morphologies are seen in a, in unison um, in broader term monomorphic uh, pattern is usually associated with uh, benign lesions whereas polymorphic vascular pattern is usually associated with malignant lesions coming to the third and most important aspect of dermoscopy that is colors dermoscopy is all about colors and it is basically the color that determines the origin of tissue or uh, origin of the structures uh, from a particular tissue so the colors seen in dermoscopy represents one or more of the basic chromophores in the skin that is keratin that imparts white color melanin that normally imparts black color and hemoglobin that imparts red color but in practice we see different color contrasts uh, pertaining to these chromophores which depends on the level at which chromophores are present for example melanin can have different shades depending on whether it is present in the epidermis at the dermoepidermal junction the uh, upper papillary dermis or deep reticular dermis and also depending on the biological state for example oxygenated hemoglobin appears bright red and uh, blue black uh, when it is deoxygenated and also the skin type it not only influences the uh, pigmentary structures but also other uh, uh, structures as well and uh, it's also an important determinant of uh, the colors that appear in dermoscopy and colors can form either homogeneous or heterogeneous patterns so these are the three basic uh, chromophores keratin melanin and hemoglobin and these are the different shades of uh, colors imparted by these three chromophores when the keratin uh, is less and lamellated it gives a whitish color and when it is more and compact it gives a yellowish color and admixed, admixed with serum it appears orange yellow color when admixed with oxygenated blood it appears uh, 
uh, dusky red and uh, uh, blue black when it is a uh, with the deoxygenated blood. So similarly, melanin when it is present in the stratum corium, it appears as black. In Malfusian layer, different shades of brown from stratum uh, granulosum till the basal layer. In papillary dermis, it appears grayish, and in reticular dermis, it appears blue and blue black as we go deeper. Hemoglobin, as I said. Uh, oxygenated one will appear bright red and deoxygenated appears blue or blue black in color. And uh, apart from this, the same color contrast can be indicated by certain other uh, phenomena as well. For example, white color is not always keratin, but it can also indicate absence of melanin or dermal sclerosis. Yellow color can also be due to sebum or fat, and black color is not always melanin, it can be also due to a thrombosed vessel, and brown color can also be due to the hemocytin deposits into the lesion. So this is an example of uh, black and brown colors of epidermal melanin. So as you can see, there are black dots which corresponds to the melanin in the stratum corneum here, and the brown color is uh, corresponding to the uh, melanin in the basal layer. So these are the blue and uh, gray colors of melanin. So the melanin when present in the papillary dermis gives this grayish areas and the blue black areas correspond to the melanin in the uh, deep reticular dermis. Similarly, keratin, white and yellow color. So when it is less and uh, lamellated as seen on histology, it appears as white color. And when it is dense and compact, it appears as yellow, uh, yellowish white color. And also here also you can see the grayish white areas, this uh, correspond to the acanthosis here. So these are the different shades of hemoglobin. So this is a bright red where the uh, blood is oxygenated and here it is blue black in color because either because of the thrombosed capillary or deoxygenated blood. So this is the white color of dermal fibrosis. The white color of dermal fibrosis has a peculiar shiny glow. Uh, this is because of the birefringent uh, properties of the collagen bundles. So this is the yellow color of fat. This is a case of xanthogranuloma and uh, the yellow color is because of the xanthomatized histiocytes. And this is the yellow color of sebum. This is a case of nevus sebaceous of genesis. And the yellow color corresponds to the mature sebaceous glands in the dermis. Now coming to the follicular abnormalities. So there can be different forms of follicular changes like follicular plugging, follicular fibrosis, perifollicular scaling, and perifollicular pigmentation. Apart from this perifollicular erythema, follicular red dots, and so many other findings are seen, but these are the common ones that we uh, see in demoscope. So now coming to the useful clues, as I told, we can usually point us to a particular diagnosis. For example, uh, the regular distribution of uniform red dots are seen in psoriasis and these are highly suggestive of psoriasis and, uh, and can be considered as a specific uh, useful clue. And here you can see the yellow orange globules with the telangiectatic vessels. This, uh, these set of findings usually correspond to granulomas, but these, uh, these are non-specific because they are seen in a variety of granulomatous condition. But although non-specific, when these structures are viewed in the context of clinical lesion, they definitely serve as useful clinical clues. Uh, hence, dermoscopy is very importantly uh, should be uh, viewed in the context of clinical picture. So now we are aware of what do we mean by structures, patterns, and colors. So collectively, when a particular structure, a set of structures, patterns formed by them associated with the colors, when they are consistently associated with the diagnosis, they form the dermoscopic diagnostic criteria. So the whole idea of dermoscopic analysis of skin lesion is to uh, repeatedly observe the lesions and frame criteria which can be employed uh, in future for the diagnosis of skin lesion. So to establish the dermoscopic criteria, one has to initiate do the dermoscopic assessment of the lesion and we have to take the dermoscopics in terms of we have a distinct histological correlation and whether this correlation is statistically significant. And all these are met to the dermoscopic diagnostic criteria. Just to give an example, so this is a brown globular pattern. 
So brown globule is a structure that has commonly seen associated amelanocytic lesion and multiple brown globules, brown globules form a brown globular pattern, a pattern that has been consistently associated with a melanocytic lesion. So because of these uh, features, multiple aggregates of brown globules forms a diagnostic criteria for melanocytic lesion. So to conclude, I'll uh, talk about some certain advantages of dermoscopy. So it's a non-invasive, quick, office-based and an OPT-based procedure, very uh, easy to perform. And the most distinctive advantage it offers is the in vivo visualization of skin subsurface structures. And uh, as uh, discussed earlier, it helps in early decision on biopsy or excision, especially in malignant lesions. And it provides a non-invasive objective assessment of the treatment response. And the images that can be shared allows uh, to carry out a remote diagnosis of the conditions as well. And as I said, uh, dermoscopy directed biopsy improves the productivity of biopsy. Now, what are the limitations? Limitations mainly correspond to the use of dermoscopy in general dermatology because dermoscopy and dermoscopic criteria are fairly well established in the field of malignancies. So, in, in, in relation to general dermatology, it is still a young and developing field. And uh, uh, many authors uh, use both metaphoric terms and descriptive terms. Some use strictly only descriptive terms. So the standardized, standardized, standardization is lacking in terms of the basic uh, description of dermatological findings. And uh, objective criteria, especially in general dermatology, are available only for a handful of conditions. And uh, as in histopathology, identical features may be seen in different set of different clinical conditions. Hence, it is very imperative to interpret the dermoscopic findings in the context of clinical picture. And as of now, it is not a replacement for histopathology. Histopathology is still a gold standard for diagnosing skin lesions. So to conclude, Dermoscopy can be considered a midway between clinical judgment and histological confirmation. It's a very useful tool in experience and so it needs a lot of uh, practice, training your eyes and brain repeatedly. It definitely adds an edge to the routine clinical diagnostic assessment as uh, discussed earlier. It either confirms your diagnosis, asserts your clinical diagnosis or gives you an alternate diagnosis as well. And most importantly, all the dermoscopic observations must be interpreted in the context of clinical picture. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for a patient listening. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, that wonderful lecture. I'm sure you've picked up the cues of the basics of thermoscopy, which has been reiterated over and over again. And I think it has been uh, put in a very simple language uh, by Dr. Keshav Murthy Adya, sir. And taking the cues from his talk where he said that histopathology is still the gold standard for a lot many disorders, I invite our second speaker for the day, Dr. Balakrishna Nikam, sir who's going to enlighten us on the dermoscopy histopathology correlation. He is the associate professor of uh, the Department of Dermatology at Krishna Institute of Medical Sciences, Karad in India. And he's also the joint secretary of the Academy of Dermoscopy. Over to you, sir. I'm sharing my screen. And we are already 10 minutes lagging in our program. So I'll be a little quicker. Uh, most of the points have been already uh, covered by uh, Kesho sir. And what I want to uh, talk about is more of uh, dermoscopy histopathological correlation. And I may have some controversial points also, which uh, whichever I feel uh, regarding the histopathological correlation of white lesions, I'm putting directly uh, without uh, uh, literature backup. Uh, okay, so all of you know dermoscopy is all about colors and patterns and these basic colors already discussed in earlier talk. Uh, as uh, 
explained by keshav sir the melanin uh, makes uh, or uh, is responsible for black shades to gray blue depending on its, uh, depending on its location on superficial to the deep dermis while hemoglobin is responsible for pink red to the blue black pigmentation depending on its location from deep to the superficial dermis while plasma lipid sebums usually gives uh, usually give rise to dull yellow to yellow brown pigmentation uh, depending on its location from deep to the superficial in the dermis and epidermis for white shades the responsibility is all depend on the melanin loss uh, so whatever the white, white shades we see are related to the pigment dilution or no melanin at all and when we see pink white lesion most of the time there is no epidermal melanin which makes the underlying erythema visible and the lesion becomes pink white similarly when we see blue white well there is no epidermal melanin and there is a deep dermal melanized cellular mass which appears blue and the superficial loss of epidermal melanin looks white another thing in histopathology it uh, also explains the shapes which are formed in uh, dermoscopy so we have dots which are due to uh, discrete deposition of pigment clots due to larger collection of pigment with cellular mass lines are mostly due to retiridges patterns while circles are due to thickening of retiridges sulci gyri are related to the papillomatosis with downward proliferation of the reti various specific shapes are there and they are related to the various cellular mass present in the dermis or uh, close to the epithelium and structureless areas are largely due to superficial collection of pigment without cells or large areas of permelanosis so this is already been explain, explained by keshav sir uh, so depending on the uh, melanin position in the epidermis to dermis the color varies and these are the different colors and shapes and these are the different shapes formed by color melanin so we are talking about color melanin and the lines so typical how lines reticular the normal lines are formed they uh, they correlates with the pigmented keratinocytes which are stacking in the slender retiridges and these lines and in between the mesh is related to the dermal papillae so this appearance of these lines depends on the pigment and the shape of this retiridge so this is an pontana mohsen stain where the slender retiridges will form a single line and the in between portion will form the mesh so typical pigment network is regularly mesh it is light brown color and thinning out peripherally so this is a typical pigment network you can see this pontana mohsen stain and this is a normal hne and this is a typical pigment network which is thinning out peripherally while in becker's nevus you see regular hyperplasia of the retiridges with increased pigmentation in the increased stacking of keratinocyte pigmented keratocyte in the retiridges this will give thickening of the uh, pigmented network with regular mesh so it becomes very dark brown in becker's similarly when you see the junctional nevus or a gentigo you will see increased number of melanocytes stacking in the retiridges as well as at the tip of the retiridges there will be nest formation so that will give again thickened uh, network coming to the lines radial which are seen in uh, reed's nevus as well as in the nevus uh, in the melanoma and they correlates with this uh, junctional nest and this junctional nest nests are forming tubules which are oriented horizontally or parallel to the skin skin surface which are coming out as an streaks similarly in melanoma you can see the pseudopods which are nothing but the collection of melanin containing mel uh, melanocytes or tumor cells which are oriented horizontally to the skin surface and at the end there is a one more junctional nest which giving you appearance of typical pseudopod formation coming to the circles now when the slender retiridges is there there will be a clear cut reticular network when the circles are typically visible when the epidermal retiridges are wide enough and permitting this less stacked keratocytes or less pigmented base to be visible as a mesh so then this edges of this thickened retiridges which are stacking keratinocytes or pigmentation will produce along with this papillary dermis a circle so thickening of retiridges will individualize in give the individuals two rows of pigmentation and that will makes the circle so it is typically seen in solar lentigo you can see there is a thickening of retiridge will individual stacking of this pigmented keratocyte will produce one line and with taking in between the papillae so this will become one circle here so similarly you will find circles here 
similar circles can be seen as white circles red circles it typically seen in clark weavers even in lentigo maligna i have seen circles in flat water also and they are typically related to the broadening of red ridges coming to the sulci gyri they are related to the papillomatosis typically seen in siboric keratosis so these are this is the papillomatosis with downward proliferation of the red ridges with there is a reticulate proliferation of uh, red ridges and they are all pigmented so there are some because of the papillomatosis there are some uh, valley formation and these valley correlates with these crypts or comedo like structures i'll come to this milia like cis lepron i'll be talking about the dots dots represent the aggregation of the pigmented melanocytes or melanophages or clumps of melanin now the color of these dots depends on the level of aggregates but is it so it's only the level of aggregates is responsible now see in lichen planus pigmentosus you see the melanophages in the papillary dermis but the color of this melanophages appears more slate gray the same position of melanophages quite in the atopic epidermis but they appear grayish more grayish more darker than the lichen planus pigmentosus this is because of there is no melanin in the epidermis of lichen sclerosus there is a squamatization basal cell vacuolation and loss of melanin if you compare with this uh, fontana mason stain of this lichen planus pigmentosus you can see there is a pigment present in the epidermal basal layer of the lichen planus pigmentosus similar to the uh, melanin you can see the presence of the pigment at the basal layer which is absent in the lichen sclerosus so this melanophages in lichen planus pigmentosus appears more slate gray color while they are more brown color in lichen sclerosus so this is an uh melanin curtain through which you are seeing and when it you open you will see a very clear picture so that's what i'm talking about the melanin curtain whenever the melanin curtain is lost in inflammatory process you will able to see the whitishness more and that will permit you the deeper dermal structures visible clearly similar to the lichen planus you can see these melanophages and brown black and i will give you the some of the evidence that even the lichen planus whatever white thing you are seeing and calling as a vicam stri is nothing but epidermal depigmentation coming to the melanoma in the black dots the, these are these are the some of the black and gray dots and they are depend on they are typically correlates with the melanin deposition in the stratum corneum individual melanocyte ascent in the stratum corneum and the epidermis similar black dots can also be seen in the deep dermis of the uh, uh, gray dots can be seen in the bowens disease and here also bowens is more or less demelanized leading to more erythematous lesion and visibility of this melanophages if this is pigmented these melanophages or these dots are not clearly seen coming to the clots they are typically forms different pattern that is globules are formed by intradermal nevus because of the nest of the melanized uh, melanos uh, nevoid cells reticular globular pattern is seen with the congenital melanocytic nevus where there is a epidermis is also involved with the pigmentation that will produce a dark reticulum like becus nevus along with the uh, you can see more blue nest and this, this is because of epidermis is dark now so you are seeing even the closer looking uh, nest of epithelium not as an uh, uh, grayish but more bluish similar to the clark nevus is a similar picture and even in the ulnar nevus you can see the reticulo globular pattern and in the combined nevus you can see the cobalt stone pattern also and it correlates with the nevoid nest in the dermis so a typical globular pattern is typically seen with the melanoma with multi component we see the different uh, variety of uh, components together and they are typically related to the presence of melanocytic nest at different levels you can see different levels at dermis and uh, epidermis as well as upper area and there are different different shapes and these are responsible for making this variety of components in the uh, melanoma coming to the various specific shapes of particularly bcc you see the spoke wheel areas the spoke wheel very areas are nothing but the usually they are gray colored or blue color blue colored and meeting at an often darker central darker axis so this darker axis is nothing but proliferating uh, basaloid proliferation of pigmented basaloid cells which is close to the epidermis and then there is a radial projection of this uh, basaloid cells Uh, which is parallel to the epidermis which leads to this spoke wheel appearance then leaf like areas in pigmented basal cell carcinoma correspond to the solid aggregation of the basal cell remember bcc is mostly connected to the epidermis so the pigment it is pigmented tumor and then 
you can see the pigmentedness in foreign skin or in skin type 3 or 2 you may not see the pigment much and you have to depend more on the vascularity of the bcc so large blue gray verses in a pigmented basal cell carcinoma they are typically correlates because they are deeper structures they are deeper and they are not connected to the epidermis but they are melanized so they'll appear bluish white nest coming to the structureless areas you see blotch and uh, blue pigmentation the black blotch is typically seen in melanoma and this correlates with the collection of the melanin in the superficial area that is stratum corneum while the collection of the melanin in the dermal uh, blue nevus you will see the blue homogeneous pigmentation but similar blotch can be formed by the uh, blood collection in the stratum corneum particularly in telonaya and you will see the similar blood collection in the stratum corneum and superficial dermis leading to the black uh, blotch or structureless area in angiokeratoma also coming to the last blue white well blue white well is seen in melanoma in melanoma the blue white well is supposed is earlier to be thought to be due to the hyperkeratosis here then that this is the epithelium and then there is a deep dermal mass of uh, melanin now this deep dermal mass of melanin becomes deep because of this hyperkeratosis and that's why it becomes blue first and second it becomes white because this epithelium has had regression area you see there is a melanin here there is no melanin here there is no melanin in the epidermis also this is why this becomes white and this becomes deeper black thing which appears as a blue so this is blue white well not just hyperkeratosis if you find epi uh, pigment here this will not become blue white well coming to the color white so i'll be talking about the color white color white and color black will produce the similar shapes only thing clots will be formed due to larger areas of amelanosis with cellular mass lines will be formed due to amelanotic rate ridges circles will be formed due to thickening and amelanosis of rate ridges sulci gyri will be formed due to non pigmented rate ridges proliferation and papillomatosis various specific shapes can also be seen due to non pigmented cellular mass and structure, structureless area areas are due to large areas of melanosis so you'll agree that white is due to amelanosis particularly in vitiligo and nevus depigmentosus because in vitiligo you see the glow and in uh, hne you don't find much of the melanocyte not much of the melanin and if you see in hne and if you compare it with the fontana mason this is fontana mason without any pigment so that's a typical vitiligo you can in see in melan a some of the melanocyte are getting stained but they are reduced in number but there is no melanin coming to the nevus depigmentosus you can see some of the patchy areas of remaining uh, uh, reticular pigmentation and same you can see some of the area of showing pigmentation at the basal layer in hne more appreciated in melan a you can see the basal layer is pigmented with normal number of melanocytes while similar to the fontana mason stain you can see the pigment here so this correlates with the nevus depigmentosus but there is no pigment in the there is no spread of the melanin in the uh epidermis uh, that is spinous layer or the stratum corneum so this is the lack of in nevus depigmentosus so white color is chiefly attributed to the keratin hypergranulosis acanthosis premature terminal differentiation like become stray and keratin pearls this is earlier attributed to but here i feel it's not it's all because of a melanosis just simple example is white eccrine openings you we we all have these white eccrine openings all over the body but there are so micro openings that you are only visible on the dermoscopy what are they they are nothing but if you see the melanin stain you can see this is the all epidermal basal pigmentation and this is perforated by this acrosyringium this is the acrosyringium this is a fontana mason stain and you can see the eccrine tubules are perforating the epidermis and this eccrine epithelium is a melanotic epithelial mass right so this is a melanotic epithelial mass which is actually creating the pores in the melanin curtain so these are the micro pores in the melanin curtain which appears as a white dots it's not air it's not stratum corneum it's just and these epithelial eccrine tubules which is producing the white thing because there is a break in this compare it with the uh, follicular epithelium which is in continuity with the epidermis is not breaking the or perforating the epidermal this thing that's why the most of the this uh, uh, follicular epithelia follicular openings are not clearly white unless this area becomes this is less uh, melanized i mean becomes completely hypomelanized it can appear white also coming to the vicam stray now vicam stray mostly related to the hypergranulosis or to hypergeratosis okay now i'll show you 
the stain now that this is a melan a stain sorry fontana mason stain so fontana mason stain staining are only melanophages in the dermis are stained the rest of the epidermis is not showing any melanin stain so it's completely depigmented epithelium similar to the melanin few of the melano melanocytes they are non functioning they are non functioning they are not producing any melanin elsewhere i'll show you the excision biopsy now this is an excision biopsy which includes the normal skin also so this is a normal this is an uh, uh, lichen planus histopathology and you see the fontana mason stain the it's lacking all the pigment here you can see some of the pigment which are the melanophages in fontana mason stain you see the normal skin and here there is a lichen planus so this normal skin is showing epidermal pigmentation you agree see this is an another side of the normal skin you can see the epidermal basal pigmentation is totally lacking in this epidermis of lichen planus this is a closer view you can see there is no pigment in the lichen planus epithelium and the pigment starts in the this thing and here again you can see there's perforation by crane gland so this is the reason we see the white areas in the which we call as the lip like venation or the thing similar picture in uh, appreciated in melanin stain this is a lichen planus active lichen planus is not showing pigment while the surrounding skin to the lichen planus normal skin is showing pigment so this is typical you can see the white areas in the lichen planus similar to the milia like cysts they are attributed to this keratin pearls right i don't think keratin is enable to give any color what is giving you the color even you can appreciate in the hne also individual keratin wherever there is a keratin formation see the basalloid cells are not able to form the keratin this is a basalloid mass of siborokeratosis inside that there are squamous cells which are normal remaining and they are trapped in the basalloid cells and they form the keratin so when wherever there is a stratum corneum or a keratin uh, pseudo pseudo keratin pearls surrounding that there is a squamous cells so these squamous cells are non pigmented rest of the basalloid cells are pigmented and these squamous cells are imparting you the white color so epithelium structure or epithelium cellular mass without melanin epithelium cellular mass without melanin among guest of the pigmented basalloid cells so whole thing is black among this it is brightly coming out as an epithelial mass mass as an milia like cis same is proved in the melanin stain you can see rest of the basalloid cells are pigmented and exactly surrounding to the stratum corneum or the pseudo horn pearls you can see the squamous cells proliferation or they are normal squamous cells of the epithelium which appears like milia cyst many times they are without stratum corneum also and these are responsible for milia like cyst coming to the trichoepithelioma similarly you see the multiple white structures in trichoepithelioma are nothing but not the keratin cyst but actual mass of the actual tumor mass and this trichoepithelioma like bcc is not connected to the epidermis the epidermis is thin but this mass is non pigmented and that's why you see more white and not blue or white like bcc same to the uh, this pattern of you uh, like in uh, uh, pigment you see the reticuloglobular pattern it looks like reticuloglobular pattern but this is molluscum this is a white reticuloglobular pattern you see these globules are, are formed due to molluscoid bodies if we do a fontana mason stain even or a melanin stain even these bodies are lacking only these some of the melanocyte which are present which are stain getting with the melanin stain but rest of the fontana mason is totally negative for pigment present in the you can see some of the melanocyte which are present which are only positive rest of the whole of the molluscoid mass is whitish because of non pigmented coming to the psoriasis psoriasis is a pink white lesion you see this is all reticular network and suddenly there is a psoriasis that is losing the network it's actually not losing the network we only focus on the scaling and this red globules these red globules are correlated with this uh, tortuous blood vessels in the papillary dermis but why they are visible they are visible because this superficial epidermis is totally lacking the pigment and that's why if you observe what is this red globules are nothing but the mesh of the white network so you are we are actually ignoring the white network in between and this white network correlates with the uh, deep melanized rete ridges which are elongated and these forms this thick or thin white network so this is proved in the excisional biopsy from the age of the psoriasis lesion you can see this is a normal epidermis and here the this evolving psoriasis you can see the pigment present here pigment present here and suddenly when it comes to the psoriasis there is no pigment so this is a typical melanin this is a normal epidermis which showing pigment 
this is an psoriasis uh, retinal ridge which is not showing pigment similar to the in a melanin you can see the pigment in the basal layer of the normal skin coming to the uh, uh, in the psoriatic lesion you can see only the melanocyte which are positive there are no melano uh, melanin transmission into the into the spinous layer so the lesion becomes white and this makes whole thing white leading to permission of the light going down and giving you more vascularity and whole thing becomes pink white lesion and you can easily appreciate the vascularity as you treat the patient first thing which happens is the coming back of the reticular pigmentation and this pigmentation again obscure the vessels and that's why in dermoscopy you see the loss of vessels earlier in treatment while uh, in histopathology you see that at, as an late expression so color white is due to the solid cellular structures without melanin the solid cellular structures can be formed due to epithelium appendages or collection of cells or tumors these form different patterns depending upon their pattern shapes and position in the dermis similar to the dle i think i have taken much of the time samipa i should finish it here sir i think you should go on because the revelations that you are making are an eye opener please go on sir okay very few slides i'll finish the dle dle i have not done a pontanomas or a melanin stain but i should do the this thing also because dle has a lot of white structureless areas which makes the visibility of the underlying dermal uh, vascularity so what happens the in dle there is a squamidization of the epidermis there is basal cell vacuolation this makes the epithelium which is at part it is uh, thinned out atrophic at part it is thickened and this uh, uh, loss of melanin curtain makes the visibility of the underlying structures which are present as an uh, white structure let's say are under underlying erythema is visible or vessels are visible or pigment incontinence visible through this atopic epidermis so this is typical melanin globules which are uh, appear as an uh, melanophages appear as an gray dots you can see the multiple uh, vessels which are proliferating uh, as an linear and uh, branching vessels you can see in the dle dermis and there is a irregular focal proliferation of the infundibula you know many times there is atrophic areas and hypertrophic areas the hypertrophic areas of epithelium which are again demelanized these forms the rosettes these forms the different fat figures so this is typically the thickening of the epithelium which is again demelanized so all the inflammatory process mostly uh, lichenoid or a psoriasis form they uh, apart from spongiotic they form more demelanization of epithelium which dermoscopically appears as a white so these might be the supportive cause like fibrosis scarring sclerosis but i will say whenever there is a sclerosis if the epidermis is pigmented like in morphia you will not see that white color as you see when the epidermis is depigmented coming to the white hypomelanosis certain areas are not totally depigmented they are hypomelanosis and these are due to spongiosis so spongiosis adds to the dilution of the epidermal pigmented there is a water inside the epidermis which leads to the dilution of the epidermal melanin curtain and that will you give you the patchy white areas similar to the exuded fluids vesicles bullae you will appear more hypomelanotic areas while the pus will appear more whitish because pus is again if collected down it is a solid nest of neutrophils if anyone has i, I have a one picture but i have lost uh, i have not included this uh, particular uh, presentation but pus usually appears very very whitish on dermoscopy this is because of it's again the cellular mass solid cellular mass which is aggregated together so these are the patchy areas of hypomelanosis seen in the spongiotic diseases this is a spongiosis so collection of this uh, water in the uh, melanized epithelium which make the dilution of some of the me melanin curtain which leads the areas of hypopigmented patchy hypopigmented areas in ple as well as you can see the uh, see them in petrosis rosea so it has been already discussed well by keshav sir the yellow color is seen more with the eczema and it is correlated with the plasma as well as blood collection in the stratum corneum which gives you yellow brown color or uh, hemocytin color and uh, just uh, to know that in trichoscopy you see this uh, uh, yellow and uh, white uh, black dots the yellow dots are uh, not seen very clearly in indian population but they are related to the uh, typical collection of the sebum in the dilated follicular infundibula okay thank you thank you very much thank you so much sir i think you you enthralled us with the lecture because uh, this is one of the best dermoscopy histopathology correlation that i have uh, 
heard and listened into and i'm sure the delegates will agree that the revelations that you have made with regards to the importance of the melanocyte and the way you have demonstrated it with regards to the special stain and its correlation this was a fantastic lecture thank you so much once again uh, for the excellent presentation and the extensive presentation sir thank you sir uh, for our third topic tips and tricks of inflamoscopy i i am privileged to welcome uh, dr renzo ericetti he is a famous name in the world of dermoscopy and one of the pioneers in dermoscopy has had innumerable contributions to the field of dermoscopy he is currently the senior consultant dermatologist and ventrologist he is affiliated with the institute of dermatology university hospital santa maria della misericordia ud in italy please uh, pardon me if i am not able to pronounce it in the right way no no you pronounce it perfectly thank I you so to, much i have to thank you uh, i have to say that uh, it's always a pleasure to join my indian friends project so i'm delighted to be here thank you so much sir he has contributed more than 118 articles he has more than 1000 citations in google scholar over 666 citations in scopus the list is endless sir i am not going into your cv because it's intimidating to read it i oh, hand the worry. stage over to you so that you can enlighten us on a tips and tricks in inflamoscopy thank you so much thank you thank you samipa thank you very much uh, so i'm going to talk about tips and tricks in inflamoscopy but before starting talking about inflammatory conditions i would like to share with you this image of course this is a tumoral lesion and i think that we all can make the diagnosis by seeing this dermoscopic image without seeing the clinical picture here we have very focused branching vessels non aggregated dots and globules and white streaks of course this is a basal cell carcinoma and uh, of course the clinical image is consistent with this uh, dermoscopic diagnosis this is to show you that in the field of tumoral diseases tumoral lesions dermoscopy may be very very specific but things change in inflammatory conditions uh, if we can look if we take a look at these two dermoscopic images i think that we cannot make any diagnosis because on the left we have just some purpuric spots on the right just no specific vessels but if we put these two dermoscopic images into the right clinical context here basically the clinical differential diagnosis is between urticaria vasculitis and common urticaria so these two dermoscopic images become very informative and may let us make the correct diagnosis indeed on the left we have an urticaria vasculitis with its purpuric spots on the right a common urticaria with without any purpuric spot this is to underline that in inflammoscopy we have to follow a two step procedure first of all we have to make a clinical differential diagnosis and then we can use dermoscopy to facilitate this differential diagnosis okay now i would like to share with you these two uh, cases uh, we have two young people with this uh, asymptomatic single nodular lesion on the face um i would like to ask you if you have any idea on the possible clinical diagnosis i think there is a chat and you can write down your opinion if it's possible i cannot see anything anyway uh, i i'd say that the main clinical differential diagnosis here uh, could be a granulomatous condition but also a lymphoma or a pseudo lymphoma if we have a look at the dermoscopic image we can appreciate orange structural cirrus in both these cases and focused branching vessels as you can see here so uh, i think that you agree with me that uh, we have two granulomatous condition because we have this uh, orange structural cirrus we have of course additional dermoscopic features in both these cases we have white scar like uh, areas and uh, on the left we also have follicular plaques and on the right media like cysts the question at this stage is uh, may we uh, be more specific in the diagnosis in other words may we suspect a specific condition in the group of granulomatous dermatosis the answer is no on the right but we can suspect something on the left um, we have a dermoscopic clue which is the follicular plaque 
I think that if I call this uh, finding yellow tears, I think that most of you may tell me that this is a leishmaniasis. And of course, this is a leishmaniasis. On the right, we have a single lesion sarcoidosis. Um, the, the main problem with uh, inflammoscopy is that we use um, a more complex and inhomogeneous and metaphoric terminology. So in our mind, we associate a specific condition with a specific term which have been described in the literature and that often does not correspond to the uh, real life. For example, in Leishmaniasis, we have the yellow tears which, has be, uh, which have been described in the literature, but actually in real life, uh, these uh, yellow tears are just follicular plaques. They are often white, and so not yellow, and they are often uh, round and not tear-like shaped. Uh, the same is valid for nodular pterygo, for example. Uh, we describe the white bus pattern, but basically uh, we just have peripheral and radial white lines. So we do need new terminology. To try to address this problem with inflammoscopy, we did a consensus on behalf of the International Dermoscopy Society, recently published on the British Journal of Dermatology, and of course, I, I don't want to bother you with terminology, but I just would like to show you the five basic parameters that we have to evaluate when dealing with inflammoscopy. First of all, we have vessels. We have to evaluate their morphology and the distribution. Um, morphology, we have four types of morphologies, dotted vessels, linear vessels, linear with branches vessels, and linear curved vessels. We also have five distribution patterns, uniform, peripheral, clustered, unspecific, and reticular. Scaling, we have three colors, white, yellow, and brown. And we have four distribution patterns. So diffuse scaling, central scaling, peripheral scaling, and patchy scaling. Follicular findings, four types of follicular findings. Follicular plaques, including yellow, white, tear-like shaped, round, oval, everything. And follicular red dots, which correspond to the presence of a perifollicular inflammation. Perifollicular white color and perifollicular pigmentation. Then we have the other structures, which include structures other than uh, scales, vessels, and follicular findings. We have to evaluate their morphology and the color. Four types of morphologies, structureless areas, including focal or diffuse structureless areas, dots and globules, lines, including networks, and circles. We also have seven colors, each of them corresponding to a specific histological background as perfectly described in the previous presentation. And finally, the specific clues which are features that when present are strongly suggestive of only one diagnosis. For example, Wickham's tria in lichen planus, peripheral keratotic tract with a double free edge in porokeratosis, and the jet with contrail sign in uh, scabies. So now um, I would like to address some tricks in common conditions that we can come across in our daily clinical practice. I, I'm sure that you all know the demoscopic features of common conditions, but I would like just to repeat them. Uh, for example, starting from uh, common papillary squamous dermatosis. In dermatitis, we have patchy dotted vessels and yellow scales and crusts. In psoriasis, we have diffuse white scaling and regular uniform dotted vessels. In pityriasis rosa, we have a peripheral colored scaling with an inner free edge, and in lichen planus, we have our weak stria. Common facial dermatosis. In cyborrheic dermatitis, we also have patchy dotted vessels and yellow scales and crusts. In rosacea, we have the vascular polygons. In the scarlet lupus erythematosus, uh, we have follicular plaques, and in granulomatous conditions, we have orange structureless areas. Another thing we, we have learned from the literature is how to distinguish dermatitis from mycosis fungalis. As I uh, told you before, in dermatitis, we have patchy dotted vessels and yellow scales and crusts. In uh, mycosis fungalis, in its uh, patchy stage, we have linear vessels and also, but less commonly, these spermatozoon-like vessels. 
Another thing we have learned from the literature is the dermoscopic pattern of Grover's disease and the Reyes disease, which is very, very patognomonic. We basically have this central star-like or polygonal yellow or brownish area with a white halo, as you can see here. So now let's see uh, some cases. Here we have um, a 43-year-old lady with these papillus squamous lesions uh, for a few weeks, no pruritus, and we also had a recent history of upper respiratory system uh, symptoms. I think we cannot interact, but I think that the most likely diagnosis here uh, would be good at psoriasis because we had a recent history of upper respiratory system symptoms. But if we have a look at the demoscopic image, we do not have the pattern of psoriasis, but we have orange structural series and focused linear and dotted vessels. So the diagnosis here is papillus squamous dermatosis. So you can see how dermoscopy may make things uh, easier. Another case, here we have a 72-year-old male with this uh, plaque, with this uh, brownish-grayish plaque for three months, no symptoms. Uh, even here, um, I would think about a granulomatous condition, but also granuloma facciale and lymphoma or pseudolymphoma. If we have a look at the demoscopic image, what do we see? We see orange structural series and branching vessels, some focused branching vessels. So according to what we, we've learned from the literature, we have orange areas, and this should be a granulomatous condition, but actually it was a granuloma facciale, which is not a granulomatous condition, but a leukocytoclastic vasculitis. So this is to underline that orange area, of course, may be seen in granulomatous condition, but not only in granulomatous conditions, even in other situations. I have to underline a thing that we have here branching vessels that are unfocused in granulomatous conditions, except for uh, granuloma annulare, vessels are very, very focused because the granulomatous infiltrate in the dermis pushes the dermal vessels upwards, so towards the surface, towards, towards our eye, thus appearing more and more focused. So, orange yellow sacral series does not necessarily mean granulomatous conditions. Indeed, we may see orange sacral series in other dermatoses characterized by dense cellular infiltrates or deposits in the dermis, what I called mass effect. For example, here we have a dorfman rosai disease, which is an histiocytosis, but we may also see orange areas in lymphomas, pseudolymphomas, nodulomyelidosis, and other conditions. We may also see orange in dermatosis characterized by hemosiderin deposition in the dermis. For example, here we have a case of pityriasis like another chronica, but we may also see uh, orange areas due to the presence of hemosiderin in the dermis in granuloma facciale, as I showed you before, but also in capillaritis, in zumbalanitis, and many others. Another thing to know is that uh, granulomatous dermatosis sometimes may lack orange structuralist areas. Basically, in two uh, conditions. When we have granulomas which are deeply located, for example, here we have a case of rheumatoid nodule, or when we have significant epidermal changes which cover the underlying orange structuralist areas, as you can see in this case on the right of leishmaniasis, but also in varicose sarcoidosis, but also in lupus vulgaris and other conditions. Another granulomatous condition that sometimes does not display uh, orange areas uh, is granuloma annularum. We know that uh, there are two main histological variants of granuloma annularum, the palisading granuloma histological subtype and the interstitial histological subtype. In the palisading granuloma histological subtype, we do have orange areas, but in the interstitial subtype, we usually don't have um, any orange area, because in this variant, we do not have a very compact, uh, very dense cellular infiltrate. Another case, here we have a young uh, male with this papillosquamous eruption for a few weeks, no pruritus, 
Um, I think that here the main clinical differential diagnosis could be uh, PT rhizis rosea and gut rhizis. Of course, we could also uh, consider uh, syphilis, but lesions are very monomorphic. So I would skip these two main clinical differential diagnoses. Let's see dermoscopy. What do we see? We see a peripheral whitish scaling, okay? So according to what we've uh, learned from the literature, it should be uh, a pityriasis rosea, but actually it turned out to be a good tetsorisis. Indeed, if we have a closer look at the center of the lesion, we may see these dotted vessels distributed in a uniform way. So this is the most important demoscopic finding in this case. This was good tetsorisis. So uh, peripheral scaling uh, does not necessarily mean um, PT rhizis rosea. It may be seen also in psoriasis and in tinea corporis, for example. In psoriasis, we also have uniform dotted vessels, which may help us distinguish uh, psoriasis from PT rhizis uh, rosea. In tinea corporis, we have a peripheral scaling, but the peripheral colorate is more irregular. As you can see here, it's indented, and uh, the free uh, margin is, uh, in, uh, is uh, inside, but also uh, in the outer part of the lesion. And in tinea corporis, you may also see follicular findings. For example, peripheral, peripheral sorry, scaling, and also broken or absent hairs because the fungus has uh, a tropism for the follicle. This is PT rhizis rosea. As you can see here, in PT rhizis rosea, we do not see uh, any uh, vessel. And if we have some vascular, uh, some vascular findings, uh, vessels are actually sparse and just few. And I have to say that in PT rhizis rosea, this peripheral uh, scaling is more elongated, especially on the trunk. And this could be a clue to differentiate the peripheral scaling that we may appreciate in PT rhizis rosea from uh, that one of psoriasis or uh, tinea corporis. This is another case. Uh, is a um, papillosquamous condition. And on dermoscopy, we have uh, yellow scales and crusts, but also a peripheral uh, white uh, no, color. Sorry? So it could be, uh, it could be uh, according to what we learned from the literature, a dermatized eczema, but actually it was uh, pityriasis rosea. Uh, this is to show you that sometimes PT rhizis rosea may also show uh, yellow scales and crusts, especially in atopic uh, patients. Another uh, set of cases. Here, the clinical suspicion might be, in my opinion, growers' disease in both these cases. But of course, they might be uh, a simple folliculitis, also uh, milialia rubra. Let's take a look at the um, demoscopic patterns. On the right, we have this very pathognomonic demoscopic pattern with uh, a central brownish star-like area with a white halo in the periphery. On the left, we just have unspecific features, some dilated vessels and white scales. So Grover's disease uh, was the one on the right, of course, but actually, even the one on the left was grower disease. This is due to the fact that uh, histology may be responsible uh, for a different demoscopic pattern in grower's disease. We know that in this condition, we have two main um, histological variants. The Darrier-like grower disease, which displays uh, the same demoscopic pattern as Darrier disease, so the pathognomonic one, the central uh, star-like or a polygonal brownish area with a peripheral white halo. But in the spongiotic Grover's disease, which is also very, very common, we do not have this pattern, this pactomromonic pattern, but we just have unspecific features, dilated vessels and white scales. Sometimes we also have uh, yellow scales. But of course, even in the spongiotic Grover's disease, 
thermoscopy may be helpful because its thermoscopic pattern is still different from that one of the main differential diagnosis, namely folliculitis and milialis rubra. As you can see here, in folliculitis, we have a central hair in the papule, and in milialis rubra, we have structureless reddish area. Now, I would like to show you these two images. We basically have a white uh, network. So according to what we've learned from the literature till now, both of these cases should be like in Planus. This should be uh, Wickham Strian. But actually, none of them was uh, like in Planus. On the left, we have a healing stage of nodular scabies, and on the right, a scarring stage of discrete lupus. This is due to the fact that reticular white areas uh, do not necessarily mean Wickham Strian. We also have the so called pseudo Wickham Strian. I named them as pseudo Wickham Strian. The difference because the real Wickham Strian and the pseudo Wickham Strian uh, is in the vascular pattern. Because uh, in, uh, in the pseudo Wickham Strian, we have vessels which are more dilated and tortuous compared to the Wickham Strian. And there is another difference, but it's not visible uh, on the image. We, can, we have to see them uh, in vivo, uh, which is the color of these white areas. In the pseudo Wickham Strian, the white areas, the white lines are brighter because these uh, lines are due to the presence of fibrosis in the dermis. So the color, the white color, is brighter compared to the Wickham Strian, which are due to the hypergranulosis typical of lichen plants. Another thing to know is that Wickham Strian may not be reticular and may not be white. For example, here we have a case uh, of uh, um, lichen planus where Wickham Strie are annular. And on the right, we have a case of Wickham Strie where the line, where the where Wickham, where the, the, the structures are roundish or star-like. This is particularly true on the palmoplantar areas. And the color, as I told you before, the color of the Wickham Strie may be white in the majority of cases, but maybe it may also be uh, bluish or yellowish. Bluish, especially in very dark uh, phototypes, and yellow uh, on the palmoplantar areas, where we have another uh, layer in the epidermis, which is the lucid uh, layer. And uh, lichen planus uh, may lack the Wickham Strie in some uh, subtypes. For example, in lichen planus inversus, we usually do not see the Wickham uh, Strie. We have um, some peppering, some brown dots on our reddish background. And also lichen planus pigmentosus uh, does not show Wickham Strie. We just have uh, this uh, brownish peppering, brownish dots. And most importantly, even in hypertrophic lichen planus, we do not see Wickham Strie because here we have uh, very pronounced a hyperkeratosis, which uh, covers the underlying hypergranulosis and so Wickham Strie. In this condition, the main clue is the presence of follicular plaques uh, corresponding to the presence of follicular hyperkeratosis on histology. This is the last case I would like to show you. This is a 62-year-old male with these reddish patches on the penis uh, for five, six weeks no symptoms. I think that you agree with me that the main clinical differential diagnosis is between balanitis and erythroplasia, of course. Let's see dermoscopy. What do we see? We see uh, uniform, diffuse, dotted vessels. So on the penis, two conditions may display dotted vessels, psoriasis and erythroplasia. Okay, so this is the clinical differential diagnosis. And what we've learned from the skin is uh, shown in this slide. Bowen disease, which is the corresponding counterpart, skin counterpart of uh, erythroplasia, usually display dotted vessels which are clustered. On the other hand, in psoriasis, dotted vessels are distributing a diffuse, uniform pattern. So according to this uh, data, what, uh, what do we have here? We have, sorry, 
a case actually of erythroplasia. Despite vessels, dotted vessels are distributed in a diffuse way, uh, we have erythroplasia, diagnosis of erythroplasia, because things are different on the penis compared to the skin. On the skin, Bowen's disease usually display clustered dotted vessels, but in erythroplasia, dotted vessels are more commonly distributed in a diffuse pattern rather than a clustered pattern, which is also possible, of course. The problem here is that it is very difficult to distinguish the dotted vessels of psoriasis, of psoriatic balanitis, from the dotted vessels of erythroplasia, especially on handheld thermoscope. But we do have some tips. In particular, in psoriatic balanitis, vessels are smaller, but most importantly, vessels are uh, more uniform in terms, of in terms of shape, size, and distance among each other. So they are very, very similar among each other. On the other hand, in erythroplasia, vessels are greater in size, but most importantly, they are less uniform in terms of shape, size, and distance among each other. So these might be the clues that may have us differentiate these two conditions, but of course, histology remains the gold standard, of course. So I uh, finished my presentation. I would like to conclude by showing you this nice memory when myself and Emilio Slalas came to India for your National Congress, and I hope to come back to India very, very soon. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, sir, for that enlightening lecture. I'm sure we have learned a lot of tips and tricks, despite the fact that we have the difference in the skin of color uh, because of the melanocyte distribution and the variations that are present. But I'm sure our delegates will find it absolutely interesting to apply the tips that you have given for um, doing inflammoscopy. In fact, um, it is one of the disorders where dermoscopy is almost diagnostic and obviates biopsy. And uh, we are really grateful to you for sharing your tips and tricks and showing the montage of images and giving the correlations with regards to histopathology as well as the clinical features. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. Thank you for your kind invitation. Yes, I have to say that there are some differences. Uh, between fair and dark skin. And for this uh, reason, we recently did a study and most of you participated in this study and I have to thank you. And this study will be available very, very soon anyway. Thank you so much, sir. I, I, I still remember your uh, uh, article in DPC, which has uh, been published in 2019 and it encompasses inflammoscopy. It was a fantastic guide for us. Thank you so much for thank the learning. You, thank you. Uh, may I invite upon our moderator for the panel discussion, Dr. Raghunatha S. He is the professor and head of ESI Hospital at Bangalore. Plus, he is the vice president of our Academy of Dermoscopy. So, I request you to take the stage and call upon the panelists for the discussion. Uh, thank you, Samipa. Um, I request uh, Dr. Enzo, Dr. Samipa, Dr. Balchandra, and Dr. Nika to join us for a panel discussion. Really, last three lectures were really enlightening. So uh, to ask questions now, it is very difficult because uh, so much of knowledge we have gained today. And I felt uh, Sunday evening worth spent listening to these three lectures. Uh, as a, uh, I would like to put question as a beginner because uh, there are very few uh, experts in dermoscopy actually because it is a developing branch and uh, recently everybody started uh, uh, using dermoscopy especially residents and postgraduate post students. So I will share the questions. Can you see the slide? Yes, sir. Yes. So, the question would be for all the uh, panelists. Uh, uh, one by one, they can express their views. And I'll, I also welcome Dr. Aspina, but madam. Sorry. Yeah. So, Whenever we first we need the dermoscopy, 
to look at the lesions and most of our residents are uh, myself had a doubt uh, which one to there are so many types of dermoscopes are there and uh, uh, so many uh, manufacturers are coming up with the dermoscope and uh, there are a lot of confusion uh, regarding which one to uh, uh, purchase i would like uh, opinion from all the panelists uh, starting from enzo dr enzo Yes, yes. So um, basically, um, in my uh, routine clinical practice, uh, I use a um, hybrid dermoscope and hybrid handheld dermoscope. I think um, this is the best one because um, I think that uh, when we, we deal with an inflammatory lesion, uh, we should use both polarized and pol non-polarized um, setting. Because sometimes non-polarized setting may help us uh, seeing um, some superficial findings, as uh, previously described in the second uh, lecture. Um, yes, I think that on hybrid, um, no matter the, 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 the brand, I think that the, the, the best choice is to purchase a hybrid thermoscope. Um, hybrid means uh, I, 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 polarized and non-polarized, which has got both the polarized and non-polarized. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Anybody else who want to add to that? Yeah. Mark. Myself? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, thank you, Anjo and uh, Dr. Prabhu. So, in India, we have a video dermoscope. The thing is, video dermoscopes are more being used in India because of their magnification and uh, uh, they have got both uh, polarized and non-polarized modes also. But what I personally feel, video dermoscope is more better for hair analysis, hair related diseases and scalp related diseases and uh, handheld that is hybrid as told by NGO. So is better for skin analysis. This is my take. And uh, why? Because uh, video dermoscope, they have a higher magnification uh, from 20x to almost 120 or 160 or 200. 220x so that analysis of hair shaft abnormalities is better with higher magnification that is why it's better for uh, hair analysis whereas uh, hybrid is better for skin conditions even for onychoscopy uh, video dermoscope is good yeah capillary capillary uh, only when uh, capillary is a nail fold capillary study we want to do it's uh, done by better by video dermoscope uh, otherwise handheld will do all these uh, uh, inflammatory conditions related uh, nail infections most of the time our residents are using uh, dermoscopy especially postgraduate students for uh, their thesis purpose and also research purpose uh, I would like to know from you uh, that to go for video dermoscopy or uh, uh, handheld uh, dermoscope because at the end of the day they have to publish and the uh, picture uh, quality should be very good and uh, the details of the uh, changes what you see under uh, different dermoscope is different so uh, what is your suggestion yeah dermoscopy is basically image related uh, uh, practice so image should be good. And when we speak about uh, publication, even more better quality image should be uh, captured. So better quality dermoscope should be taken. And uh, video dermoscope, there are many video dermoscope brands are there in India. But you should uh, buy a good one. Uh, and uh, handle dermoscope also, there are two main uh, brands are there in India. So we can purchase those. And for the residents, uh, it depends on uh, whether they take a uh, hair related thesis topic or skin related. So it highly depends on that. But handheld dermoscope can also do better uh, uh, study on hair disorders as well. So in future, thinking of future, uh, one should go for handheld dermoscope. So it will uh, help both in, in their future uh, consultation. Okay. May I say something? May I say something? Yeah. Yes, um, I, I completely agree uh, with Balachandra, but the point is that in, in clinical practice, uh, you know, handheld dermoscope is more easier to 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 bring. You know, uh, we, we can take it in the pocket 
and I think that we can do um, further zoom by you know uh, link your mobile with the uh, with the demoscope so we can zoom uh, further the lesions with our phone. I don't know if you use this uh, you know this this setting. I agree. I agree with you. Yeah, we can zoom in. Because, you know, uh, video dermatoscope is a little bit big, you know, to, to put in the pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and the cost factor is also there. Yes. Sir, yeah. I think uh, while you are choosing a dermatoscope, the thing that you cannot compromise on is the optics of the dermatoscope. So, so long as the optics of the dermatoscope is good, I think you are good to go. Uh, second thing I feel like Dr. Enzo also said that uh, video dermoscope is cumbersome because you will require a monitor, you will require your attachments. And if you're going to be having like a practice where you are visiting multiple setups and clinics, it becomes a little difficult to move the whole thing around. This, uh, the handheld dermoscopes are mostly all pocket dermoscopes. And with the zooming facility, I think uh, uh, the magnification or the visualization of the elements is quite good. Even for trichoscopy, I feel like uh, handheld dermoscopes does give us a very good image uh, for clinical correlation as such. Okay, once we get the uh, dermoscope, as a beginner, actually we don't know the exact technique also, we don't know how to focus and all. How to start using the dermoscope? There will be patients coming to us and how to use, start using it because many of us are in that stage. Uh, we would like to know from the experts how to go about once we got the dermoscope. Samipa? So don't laugh if I say this, but I have a lot of moles on my skin. So I think the first thing that I did when I got my dermoscope, I got a handheld dermoscope, but I started focusing the dermoscope first on my own skin. I started learning what are the normal patterns on my own skin. I started assessing various, um, uh, the, the different molds that I have on the skin. So I think you can start doing dermoscopy, not just on your patients, but on your peers and colleagues when you want to start learning because you need to know what is normal first. Uh, second thing, if you are going to be initiating dermoscopy in the times of COVID now, uh, what I have started doing is because again, you know, you are going to have, it, it's mostly going to be contact dermoscopy and that uh, poses as a risk. So what I have started doing is I've started wrapping my dermoscope completely in a cling film so that I can discard it after every patient. So uh, that's one tip that I am using. Second thing, uh, third thing is how should you focus so that you get your images and how should you capture your images? I always move from the non-polarized mode to the polarized mode, no matter what the lesion is. So I start with non-polarized and go to the polarized mode. I will capture images in both non-polarized as well as the polarized mode. And I will capture images with the use of a contact fluid as well. If we are going to start using contact fluid, I generally prefer the colorless, uh, clear colorless ultrasound gel uh, most of the times. Uh, the, the, the place where I find using dermoscope as a beginner very tricky or which I used to find it very tricky was for vascular lesions. Like uh, it is difficult to suspend the dermoscope on the ultrasound gel when you are initiating your practice in dermoscopy because you don't have that uh, acumen to handle your dermoscope. But with practice, I think uh, you can go ahead and learn. And uh, the last tip that I would always give to somebody who's initiating dermoscopy is say, for example, you have a lesion in a particular area and you have the normal skin, always assess the normal skin first because there are variations in normal skin. Like what may be the pattern on your skin may not be the same pattern in the patient's skin. So always assess the normal skin first and then go on to your uh, disease skin so that you have a baseline control. And finally, if you could start doing dermoscopy with histopathology correlation, I think it will become a fantastic learning tool for you because you have the clinical, you have the dermoscopy and you have your histopath. So the learning process becomes very easy, actually. Anybody else would like to add their experience? Samipa said everything. I just would like to stress for the beginners that uh, we have to learn histology. 
if we know histology and if we know the basic parameters to evaluate in inflammoscopy, we can recognize many, many conditions, even if we never saw them. Okay, so the demoscopic pathological correlation is very, very important. So uh, before starting using the demoscope, we have to know the histology. This is the best tip I can give. Yeah, that's the better. Yeah. So next one is taking pictures. Images are very important, especially in dermatology. Uh, how to take pictures uh, uh, and how to avoid that black halo. Palchandra, Yeah, I, I uh, come across many images are uh, shared with me, with many residents and my practitioner colleagues. Uh, they have a black halo uh, around the image captured. Uh, that is because of uh, non-rotating uh, uh, the dial properly. So in handheld dermoscope, there is a mark zero. So we should rotate the dial of the dermoscope until that mark zero, so that uh, that uh, image is clearly uh, captured without any black halo. And uh, as Samipa told and Enjo told, we should also uh, not uh, put many pressure, like too much pressure will uh, blanch the vascularity. So this is how one should take a picture and avoid black. One should have dedicated attachment to the um... Dermoscope to fix earlier, the camera or... Yeah, yeah, earlier dermoscopes, they used to have uh, uh, that facility. Nowadays, uh, all the dermoscopes, uh, hybrid dermoscopes, they're coming with only for the smartphone, universal adapter. It, it has got universal adapter and uh, that's will, that will attach to only smartphone. Uh, we cannot attach to a, uh, a dedicated camera, digital camera. So... And I also uh, suggest who is the starting thermoscope, they should have a register. They should have a register. They should uh, write clinical diagnosis, time, date, when the uh, images are captured. So that... Uh, one of yeah. the questions is how to store images because uh, we started start clicking the images and how to store them. Yeah, I do, uh, I do uh, maintain a register and I store the images uh, in a disease-wise uh, folders. So yeah. I, by clicking the image, we'll come to know the date and uh, uh, time of the image taken. So I retrospectively go to the register and uh, check for the diagnosis. Okay. Any other comments on this? Because it is very difficult uh, when you are seeing many patients and you are clicking many images. And if you are busy, uh, it will be uh, quite difficult. Is there are there any tips for this apart from register maintenance and all? Sir, uh, I, I don't know if it is feasible. I would uh, request them to have a dedicated smartphone for their for the dermatoscope so that you have everything in one piece in one um, uh, in one device. And then uh, what I would generally say is uh, to decanter the images every weekly or every fortnightly depending on the uh, patient load that you have because uh, unless you actually tag the images and keep it will be extremely difficult you can use the patient phone number or you can use the patient id number or um, you can use codes that you can give so that's the way i generally do it uh, dr enzo how do you store the images yes we have dedicated uh, cameras and uh, at the end of the, of the day, we download all the images and we put them uh, onto the computer and then we have uh, the storage. Uh, I, I would like also to comment on, the, um, on another question, how to improve the visualization of yeah. vascular pattern. Yeah, vascular pattern. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, uh, I usually use um, a little bit of oil to reduce the scaling. And uh, of course, polarized setting is better, but to, um, to, to enhance the visualization of the vessels, uh, I sometimes remove the contact part of the demoscope, so I, uh, I, I, I don't press the, the lesion, okay? This is the best way to also take a picture of the vessels. Because if we uh, use, um, you know, a, a contact part, 
uh, we cannot um, see the vessels properly. And this is important also to uh, take a picture because um, we cannot take a picture without any contact with the skin, okay? Because we cannot focus very well the lesion. So uh, I think that this tip may be very helpful. We can put the dermoscope like this, but the central part is not uh, in contact. So I think that this is the best way to visualize the vessels. Yeah. I don't know your opinion. Yes, that is a good idea and it will be like a polar non-contact dermoscopy. Mm -hmm. where, uh, that is not coming. Yeah, polar non-contact is, is good, but it's not good to take pictures. I, I, I cannot focus the lesion when, I, yes. when I, do, I, don't, I don't have a contact, you know. So I, we, we should have uh, somehow a contact with the skin. Yeah. Yes, now coming to that... Uh, Polarized versus non-polarized, uh, whether we have to use this both uh, in each and every case or uh, in particular epidermal lesions or dermal lesions. How do you go about it? Samipa? So, no, I think in the learning stage, definitely we should be capturing images both in the non-polarized as well as the polarized mode. As we advance, go ahead. And uh, when we know, when we are more comfortable with the features that, uh, and we know that, okay, a particular condition is better visualized in a polarized mode, I would do it. But if it is something like uh, trichoscopy, I will definitely do it in both the modes. If it's something like infomoscopy, I will definitely do it in both the modes. And it is always a good idea to have both the modes captured because in case if you have missed out on certain feature, you can retrospectively go back and check that and learn from it as well. So I uh, personally prefer capturing the images of any lesion. It doesn't matter which one uh, in both the modes, non-polarized as well as the polarized mode. Okay, is it possible to using both uh, polarized or non-polarized to differentiate uh, epidermal and dermal? For example, uh, we have a question like uh, white structure due to collagen or keratin because keratin is usually in the superficial and collagen is in the der dermal. Is it possible to differentiate uh, using polarized and non-polarized? Because both will be, uh, as uh, Nikams are told, it is a A melanosis. Uh, can we make it if it is uh, differentiate? Uh, we can make make a differentiation if you use polarized and non-polarized because polarized to penetrate deeper and we can visualize deeper one and the non-polarized is the superficial one. Can we differentiate using uh, polarized and non-polarized? Nikam sir? Yeah, I think uh, if uh, keratin uh, is showing parakeratosis, so yeah. it is nucleated keratin, then uh, it's a cellular mass. So it will be easily visible as an exfoliating scale on uh, non-polarized, non uh, even as well as uh, polarized. And uh, if uh, there is a, a dermal fibrosis or collagen is very well thickened and your epidermis is not very greatly melanized, uh, you can see it on uh, uh, making the light uh, polarized. Yeah, Raghunath? Yes, please. I, I totally agree with Nikam, sir. And one more thing is uh, collagen. Collagen, uh, most of the times it's visible only with polarized dermoscope. Yes. Uh, so Non-polarized dermoscope doesn't uh, reveal uh, collagen. Yeah. So collagen, most of the times it's revealed as a white uh, shiny streaks. So yeah. this is possible with polarized. Yeah. yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. Because as I showed you before, uh, we may have Wickham 3A and pseudo Wickham 3A, which are due to the fibrosis. With polarized dermoscope, uh, the pseudo Wickham 3A, which are due to uh, fibrosis, uh, appear brighter with the polarized uh, setting. So, of course, it is uh, very important to use the polarized setting to differentiate the white color due to hyperkeratosis, hypergranulosis, and the white color due to fibrosis. Another uh, differentiation what we look for is uh, differentiation between uh, sebum and demodex. Uh, both uh, appear almost uh, same and uh, uh, I would like your opinion how to differentiate uh, sebum and uh, demodex. Balchandra? Uh, as for my discussion with NGO regarding this, uh, sebum excretions are seen in few conditions. Uh, for example, uh, dyssebacia, uh, 
and uh, seborrheic dermatitis affecting the face and dermatitis folliculitis i discussed with uh, dr enjo regarding this so we we came to a uh, slight conclusion that uh, the sebum excretions they are more whitish and they are broader and they lack uh, central hair whereas the demodex tails they are uh, slender and longer uh, they have a hair uh, in the center of the spicule it's, we call it as spicule so uh, it's slightly yellowish demodex tail is slightly yellowish and i request uh, dr enjo to add uh, few more points regarding in this uh, question Yes, we already discussed about it. I, I deeply agree with you. Uh, I think that the um, the, the sebum is uh, you know broader and shorter uh, and has this um, folli the, the follicle, uh, the hair. Uh, while on the other hand, in Demodex, uh, we have this uh, thinner and longer structures. In my opinion, in in fair skin, actually, uh, we do not see sebum. Uh, I, I do see uh, patients with darker phototypes, but in fair skin, we do not see sebum. So this is um, an issue, especially for darker phototypes. But as we discussed, I think that these are the differences. Yeah. yeah. That's going to most important as suggested by all the speakers that uh, before uh, dermoscopy, using dermoscopy, we must know histopathology. And we today we have uh, had enlightening lecture by Dr. Nikam. Um, I would like to put a basic uh, question because he has shown he is very good in uh, dermatopathology. Does uh, dermoscopy improve the accuracy of histopathological diagnosis? If you get better uh, dermoscopic feature, whether it improves the histopathological diagnosis or in uh, any other way it improves Yes, sir. We, we are just adding one more dimension to our diagnosis, first of all. Like we have a clinical information always. And with that, we are doing biopsy. So that was the only earlier. Now we have a dermoscopy. So we have one more horizontal dimensions available here. So we have uh, what is happening about the vessels and what is happening about the uh, epidermal retinaceous, what is happening about uh, the uh, behavior of the tumors inside, which is seen by horizontal dimension. So that additional information definitely helps for the histopathological correlation. Even if you take BCC, even if you take uh, uh, carcinomas like uh, Bowen's disease, or it's very much helpful, particularly in diseases of uh, hair. In trichoscopy, the pictures of dermoscopy, particularly uh, horizontal dimensions pictures, are very, very clear. You know, you even if you just put a dermoscope and you can easily tell that this is an alopecia errata. This is not that easy on a vertical sectioning of the uh, histopathology. Many times we have to correlate with the uh, clinical findings. Now we have a good uh, dermoscopic background, so we can easily correlate whole things with the uh, dermoscopic findings. In histopathology of alopecia areta, many times there are very, very subtle findings. It, it's getting confused with the androgenic alopecia. Many times it gets confused with the telogen effluum. And then we just ask them for the uh, dermoscopic image and the dermoscopic image make it very clear. So there are many other such uh, things where uh, dermoscopy always helps for the histopathological correlation and diagnosis. Sometimes it is, it is the diagnosis by dermoscopy than histopathology. <clears throat> Uh, whether uh, what about the site of biopsy? Whether this yes, that, that's also a good thing if you want to uh, uh, say differentiate between uh, psoriasis and some other eczema. You just start finding with the dermoscopic uh, uh, site of biopsy, and if you find a classic uh, features of uh, histo uh, dermoscopic features of uh, psoriasis at one place, and if you took a biopsy from that area, that will definitely show psoriasis clearly. Yeah. Rather than an, a modified uh, zone like uh, elbow, uh, like uh, uh, some frictionated area. Yeah. Similar to the alopecia areta, active margin can be selected. You can see that uh, exclamation mark and take a biopsy from that side. For the lichen planus, you can see the become stray and take a biopsy from that. So there are uh, many clues, even, even if you are, you are asking about the how the new beginners should start with. So they should start with the uh, putting the dermoscope on the classical lesions first so that they should know the how the classical lesion is seen and then then they'll get the confidence that this is how the classical lesion is seen so then they should biopsy that classical lesion and they correlate with that thing and then they should um, uh, correlate the similar thing with the non-classical uh, lesions so that, that's how the histopathology and dermoscopy should be learned i think in uh, especially in the granulomatous conditions it is more important dermoscopy identify the granulomatous part and take the biopsy 
Most yeah. of the time we miss the granuloma when we take biopsy. I think yeah, right. that is more That's one more, yeah. So we have talked about more Enzo, Dr. Enzo has talked about more of uh, uh, vascular patterns, how they are useful in diagnosis of many uh, inflammatory conditions. Is it possible to correlate? Because when we read the histopathology of vascular, we don't see much of vascular patterns. We see dilated tortures. What we see is different patterns are there. Is it possible to correlate uh, vascular patterns with histopathology? Dr. Nikam? See, except the larger tumors like hemangioma or um, uh, capillary malformation like uh, port wine stain or uteca angiokeratoma or lymphangioma circumscriptum, I don't think the smaller vessels are uh, are that visible uh, as you see in dermoscopy. Dermoscopy has that liberty. Dermoscopy has that vision of showing the all the linear transfer, tra the tra transversing vessels which are in arborizing pattern or uh, linear pattern or the, that different circular pattern, glomerular pattern, so many patterns are visible on dermoscopy and that's an advantage of dermoscopy, which is absolutely not seen in uh, vertical orientation of the histopathology where they are cut vertically in only one dimension as in a dot or as, the, as in a circle or as, a, as, in, as in tortuous material, that's it. So if you take uh, the tumors, yes, it might be get correlated like angiokeratoma and all uh, I, as I uh, earlier mentioned, but uh, for these uh, arborizing vessels and uh, tortuous vessels, glomerular vessels, this is not at all correlated on the histopathology because of the orientation is different. It's totally 90 degree orientation of the two uh, scopy. This is already we have discussed. Um, my question, this is the most important one. Is it possible to replace histopathology with dermoscopy for inflammatory dermos dermatosis? See, it's, it's not possible or, uh, or replacement, but definitely it's an additional dimension to diagnose uh, uh, this thing. You can cut down the number of histopathology or number of biopsies you are doing. If you are uh, in a busy OPD, if you are seeing uh, say about uh, 100 patients and in out of 100 patients, 10 patients are coming with a different, different confusions. Out of 10, if you, use, if you are using dermoscopy regularly, I think you can solve almost 60% of the cases out of that 10 that these are uh, this particular diagnosis and treat and on that uh, way and uh, with the treatment you will come to know the uh, diagnosis also while remaining the four you may require histopathology that's how you cut down from 10 to uh, four biopsies so that's how you can uh, definitely cut down the number of biopsies but not like totally replace it whenever the doubt you should go for histopathology yeah Paul Chandra. yes yeah, yeah, I totally agree with Nikam, sir. Uh, histopathology is a gold standard, so there is no replacement by dermoscopy. Dermoscopy is an additional. And uh, how many questions are remaining, Raghu? It's uh, almost time. Yeah. Yes. Last question. Last question, please. Huh? Yeah, just uh, uh, one of the important uh, uses of uh, dermoscopy, what I feel, is monitoring response to treatment. I would like uh, Dr. Enzo to comment on this. So, uh, do you use for monitoring the response to treatment, dermoscopy, in uh, inflammatory dermatosis? Yeah. Of course. Of course. Uh, this is a very important part of inflammoscopy. I do use dermoscopy in monitoring, but also in predicting therapeutic response in inflammatory conditions. I recently uh, wrote a, a review on this topic, which will be published in a few days on dermatology and therapy. Uh, this is very, a very important part. For example, I would like to give you an example. In Rosacea, uh, we have a different response according to the uh, dermoscopic pattern. In particular, when we have uh, protruding follicular plaques, we have a greater response to ivermectin. When we do not have these follicular plaques, we have a, a better response to metronidazole, of course, topical metronidazole and topical ivermectin. But there are many, many other applications. Uh, I hope you will read my paper. Uh, I wrote very, very uh, many, many uh, applications in this regard. And uh, yes, of course, we can also uh, choose the drug according to the dermoscopic pattern as I uh, just told you. This is my, uh, my, I do it in my clinical practice. Balchandra? Yeah. 
Yeah, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Enjo. Even uh, this, uh, for example, DLE, when we see DLE under dermoscope, uh, if you see red dots, it, it implicates its uh, inflammatory phase of DLE. So we can give immunosuppressive therapy. When we see only white areas without any vascular patterns in DLE, so there is no use of using uh, immunosuppressive at that stage. Yeah. Samipa? Sir, I totally agree because uh, even for simple condition like psoriasis, when we are uh, tackling it, we see that the disappearance of those uh, red dots and globules which were there in regular sheets, they will disappear once you start giving the treatment, whether topical or oral. And um, uh, I think it is very important uh, because the patient compliance improves. When you show them these images, Apart from seeing that their uh, lesions are disappearing on the skin, they see the microscopic changes and uh, they are very impressed with it and their compliance as well improves. So, yes, definitely. I think as uh, Dr. Enzo has mentioned, we can predict the response to treatment or non-response to treatment very early um, then to wait for the clinical response to occur, which usually takes uh, 15 days or one month. And if, if we can use uh, dermoscopy on the lesion, uh, uh, immediately after treatment, a few, few days after, we can predict uh, this patient is responding or not responding. Uh, I think uh, with this, we will end this uh, question and answer session. I thank all the panelists for uh, giving their opinion on the various aspects of uh, dermoscopy, especially in uh, inflammatory dermatosis. I once again thank one and all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much, Raghunatha, sir. I will just uh, conclude the session by saying that uh, I am really grateful to our speakers for uh, taking time out on a Sunday evening, but it's a Sunday well spent, so I'm eternally grateful to them for imparting their knowledge. Thank you so much, Raghunatha, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Enzo. Thank you so much, Dr. Nikam, sir. Thank you so much, Ankit, sir, as well as uh, Keshav, sir, for imparting your wisdom to us. And uh, we look forward to many such fruitful meetings in future from the Academy of Dermoscopy. Signing off. Bye-bye. Good night. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.